Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 474. That's 474 of the Agostino Zynga Show. How you doing? How you feeling? great amazing good to know if it's your first time check out the show via youtube you know what to do smash that like hit subscribe and of course leave me a comment down below with your thoughts feelings and suggestions i would be gracious to see them and gracious to ignore them if you're listening via the podcast app of course a five-star review and a share will help the show go a long way and of course support via patreon is always more than welcome at patreon.com for us agostino you can find the link in the show notes and descriptions wherever you're playing this and wherever you see this yada 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 how have you all been yada 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 da, 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 da. sounds like that loony little easy first song and then off white but anyway but i hope you guys are well wherever you are i am doing fairly decent just got my little pump on feeling refreshed and ready to go jumped out of the shower first shower in the week feeling good no i'm joking um <laughs> i try and take them as regularly as i can especially now that i'm going to the gym the last thing you want to do is be you know um providing your fellow gym goers with this um un what you call it unwanted bodily stench you know things that they didn't actually call for once they're in there so i try and keep myself as clean as i can for my fellow citizens but yeah how have you been um how have i been what's been going on the weekend not much really there's been a there's been a couple of four storms a little bit of um a little bit of worry within um club scene wise in terms of what's going on with lockdowns we have to i think in the uk we are being conf the confirmation of the restrictions being lifted completely on the 19th will be confirmed later on today to the 12th we'll get an understanding as to where we are exactly and when we can if we can hope to get back in a club sooner rather than later the omens aren't that great there's some stuff happening in Ireland, stuff happening in Netherlands that's kind of making me a little bit worried. Um, it's a bit of a squeaky bum time. So I'm pretty sure a lot of people are kind of paying attention to that. Deck Mantle over the weekend got cancelled um, due to the restrictions being obviously put back in place in Netherlands. Um, Ireland has got some weird thing about under 18s and being unable to drink and stuff like this. Some really bizarre things happening. I know there's a province in Australia or district or something like that that somehow got a new lockdown being enforced now. So weird stuff is happening very are popping out all over the place it seems as if all of these governments the, you know across europe across the world the little bit of power that we've given them over this period of covid they are just reluctant to let it go in any way shape or form they want to be um they want to decide our futures and decide our freedoms and what we can do and what we cannot do and they just want they just don't want to give us our back our autonomy which is really just disturbing but also it's a little bit um you feel a bit powerless really in the whole scheme of things because you know as much as you may complain things aren't going to change until they change like very you know we've had flipping mass protest off the back of the george floyd thing and you know black people are still getting murdered um, out there in the states by police officers um we've had protests over many numerous things and it doesn't seem as if things really change you know there's an uprising happening now at the moment in parts of cuba the israel palestine stuff is still going on but unfortunately it's out of the news cycle so people stop caring about it there was an unfortunate incident again over, the, I think, the weekend, a couple of days ago, somewhere in Spain, of a, of a young um, homosexual kid that unfortunately got, you know, murdered, it seems like, outside of a nightclub due to some crazy homophobic attack. So there's stuff happening all over the place that's kind of getting everybody a bit down and making things a little bit hard to comprehend. But over the weekend, there was some stuff to get our mind off of, st off of the troubles of the world, such as, you know, UFC and obviously the Europe, uh, sorry, the Euro 2020 final. Um, so, yeah, going to open with that and then obviously get on with all the other topics I've got lined up for you. So grab yourself a little drink or whatever else snack that you're having and let's dive on deep. So first thing to kind of get into, of course, was UFC 264. Um, the main card obviously was um, spearheaded by Dustin Poirier, Conor McGregor number three. The whole card itself from the front to the back, you know, from the early prelims to the prelims to the main card was absolutely great. Um, there's a lot to be said for not having fans in the UFC. And I think what Dana White has done, the one good thing he's done apart from, you know, because he does many, many other bad things, especially, you know, the fighters pay, the recent stuff at the moment with the, that crypto flipping sponsorship where there's a new um, cryptocurrency website has sponsored or has basically put their logo on one of the warm-up kits or the kits that the, the UFC fighters come out into the octagon with. And I think they signed a deal up to like 150 or $70 million, something insane. 
and then he was pressed about how much the fighters were going to get of that deal and supposedly they're not going to get anything that's just going straight to the UFC's um, bank account and then I guess individually if the fighters want to arrange a deal or work something out they can but in terms of breaking off the fight as a little chunk he hasn't done that but the one thing he has done which you have to give him credit for throughout the entirety of lockdown Dana White has ensured that from what he said anyway we don't really know but allegedly no one in the UFC has been let go there's some fighters have obviously been cut but in terms of the infrastructure working in the UFC head HQ or head office no one's been sacked during COVID he's hang on to everybody and essentially been able to provide all fighters who want to fight that he would say an opportunity to earn some money which is definitely something you can't really um, scoff at and he's basically proved that you can run a successful UFC card without having fans, you know, from the Fight Island stuff to the other things that have been done behind closed doors. It works mostly because, you know, for the most part, if you are training in MMA or mixed martial arts or any other form of martial arts, you tend to do a lot of sparring. Um, sometimes you tend to have a lot of kind of tournaments and competitions within different gyms. So the idea of not having spectators is something not really foreign to a lot of fighters. If anything, the spectator side of things actually makes things a bit more complicated. It kind of makes, you know, adds nerves, the bright lights and the pressure and the betting and the, all this stuff kind of, and the press and the media that will kind of makes it a little bit harder for some fighters. Actually, most fighters, if not the, you know, the best you see a lot, even in basketball, they say some of the more, let's say, um, um let, let's say the, the the basketball players who aren't as big who aren't as a big profile probably shun a lot earlier especially during the early parts of lockdown when there wasn't any fans um because it was a lot like training they didn't have the pressure of playing in the big arena with the fans kind of chanting and all that sort of stuff and saying mad things to you in the crowd um so obviously he proved that but there is something to be said for having live audiences there's no real going getting around it live audiences and any kind of sport really does add to it and from the early prelims the energy was amazing um i think the early the first fight if i'm not mistaken finished in the first round it was like a it's like a it's like a guillotine choke I don't know what that is where you kind of you twist it underneath that was a fairly great finish but of course we just skip right forward to the main fight of course Dustin Poirier versus Conor McGregor Dustin Poirier was victorious um he um, won within the first round this is article here obviously from the BBC kind of depicting it that's in Poirier beats Conor McGregor after Irishman breaks his leg in the first round the Irishman 32 was stopped after the first round against former interim lightweight champion that's in Poirier replay showed his ankle rolling over after he stepped backwards seconds before the end of the second round sorry the first round and the fight was stopped by doctors handing Poirier his second straight win in their trilogy and McGregor shouted it's not over he said if I have to take this outside let's take it outside he added he was interviewed while sitting on the canvas with his ankle strapped to protective cars before being taken out of the ring on the stretcher UFC President Dana White said after the fight Conor had broken his lower tibia in his left shin Mirakas defeated Poirier via first round TKO 178 in 2014 but the American also failed to even the score with a second round TKO UFC 257 in January it meant the rivalry was perfectly poised heading into a trilogy bout in Las Vegas and it was Poirier who emerged victorious in unfortunate circumstances so the fight itself was um fairly i think if answered a lot of questions it did answer questions in terms of because i think a lot of people said prior to the second fight if i'm not mistaken the the story goes conor mcgregor was allegedly training for a fight with manny pacquiao some sort of charity exhibition boxing match and that fell through last minute and then um obviously because he was training and wanted to still be active in ufc he decided to then step up and fight dustin poirier but because he spent so long obviously training in boxing he didn't necessarily have the timing or the stance or whatever required to be um proficient in obviously fighting in the ufc and again i guess in that time he was away um i guess leg kicks or calf kicks became a thing which he obviously wasn't necessarily aware of or his, tra or his coaches maybe didn't train for i don't know that's the story that, that allegedly that alleges and so when he obviously went to fight pori in the second fight he was very front foot full front foot heavy um, he obviously wasn't checking any of the kicks. He wasn't in that kind of orthodox or unorthodox sort of karate stance that you sort of know him. We saw sort of kind of famous for, and he's kind of was fighting a little bit more like a boxer as opposed to like a mixed martial artist. And eventually, of course, that ended up costing him, and he ended up losing that fight in the second round. And then, of course, six months later.
later when he was training for this one, it felt as if he needed to kind of tap back into that old style Connor and he did answer that. I think the opening kind of seconds of the first round, he was throwing mad spinning stuff, right? Um, he was really going for it. You saw a lot more spinning attacks than I've seen in Connor's fight ever in the past previous fights for the most part. And it looked to be working pretty well. He kind of um, hit Dustin with a lot of leg kicks earlier on. And then I guess sometime between the end of the first round and um, Dustin then ended up kind of getting him to the ground and getting some scoring some really good points in terms of ground and pound and controlling him and it was kind of going the way a lot of people expected it Connor really only has one way to win which is obviously on his feet but Dustin has a lot more tools in his arsenal but then obviously Connor also has the knockout power so it was perfectly poised I thought for the second round I think a lot of people are saying oh no um, Dustin clearly won he was going to win he was obviously on the uh, surgency yes that's possibly true but I still think the dangerous thing about Connor is that regardless of the weight class, especially maybe heavier weight, people say he doesn't necessarily have the knockout power he did when he was the lower weight. I forgot, does it straw weight, whether that was underneath. Um, he still has the ability to put people to sleep. That left hand is still, you know, it's a piston. So I still think there was a possibility in the second round that he could have um, kept distance. He could have kind of prevented a few of the takedowns. His takedown defense isn't the greatest in general, but I think he could have maybe given Dustin a lot of things to worry about second round that could have made the fight a lot more interesting. Maybe five rounds, Dustin would have probably end up winning because we know Connor's gas tank isn't the best. But then sometime between the first, he broke his leg. And a lot of people obviously were hypothesizing, oh, because um, this is the thing, it happens a lot at UFC. Whenever someone loses, there's a lot of revisionist history, a lot of kind of going back to things and analyzing things that don't really matter. So before he fought, Connor, everyone was saying, oh, he needs to throw more spinning attacks, he needs to throw more kicks. He throws more kicks and everyone's then saying, oh, no, he shouldn't have, he didn't, he couldn't, he shouldn't have thrown them because he wasn't conditioning enough. He didn't have the inadequate training. He, he's not been active enough. It's like, choose your, you know, you, you got to choose your position. If anything, He's, a, he's kind of, um, if you look back at his tape, he's known for throwing loads of kicks, right? This is what Connor does. T kicks, body kicks, head kicks, leg kicks. Like this is what he does. Maybe the calf kick is new, but in terms of everything else, you know, we, we've known Connor for being really kick heavy and of course being able to kind of throw that left hand and knock people's lights out. So he obviously did it. He did it. He kind of answered that point. Then sometime between that first round Dustin must have checked the kick because I didn't really believe I thought my initial feeling was that maybe he had loads of micro fractures and maybe because of the lack of conditioning you know, the lack of maybe activity in terms of he's not fighting often enough to kind of keep his legs as strong as possible that might have happened in terms of breaking it but I was more of the thinking that he either checked it or it was a micro fracture that he had prior in training that obviously then got exasperated when he was fighting. But then when you look closely at the actual fight itself, I think Dustin, first of all, said it was a check that he felt something go in the Connor's leg. But then if you actually look at the video um, footage, I think maybe 15 seconds before the end of the first round, um, Connor goes to, I think if I'm not mistaken, he goes to T-kick, um, Dustin Poirier in the stomach and Dustin Poirier kind of covers and puts his elbows and brings his elbows together to kind of cover his um, abdomen um, which obviously you could tell it was starting to affect him those kicks to the T and then as he's covering his abdomen um, Connor's shin hits the bottom of his elbow and it kind of pop kind of snaps a little bit there already and obviously as he's stepping back to kind of you know throw um, his left hand as um, Dustin pointed out at the end of the fight it then obviously completely breaks and it's kind of you know it's obviously it's incredibly disgusting to see um, his entire leg kind of give way and his ankle go the complete opposite way and he's kind of screaming for agony and then by then of course the fight is obviously called off um doctor says he can't continue to fight anymore and the fight is over but it's just funny to see the referee and the, and the coaches and the doctors look at him and say are you all right it's like he's clearly not his leg is his foot is twisted the other way i'm not sure if they're trying to check if he could still fight but it was definitely over from there and then they got into a bit of an argument and kind of cussing and swearing match back and forth which you know people can read as much into it as they want i think for the most part yes maybe kind of overstepped the mark by saying he went to murder dustin poirier he's going to leave in a stretcher and again the irony of that it was kind of ended up leaving in a stretcher himself and i think the memes are going to write itself in that way but i don't think i don't really read too much into that i think if anything what this basically proved is that Connor is just too rich. He's too affluent. He's too wealthy. He's too successful outside of UFC for this to matter. I think for the most part, the origins of MMA, the origins of this kind of cage fighting in general has very humble beginnings, but it also requires people to kind of have um, 
a lot kind of riding on it, right? You kind of have to have your family's future, your family's ability to eat and to have shelter and to have a warm home in the back of your head to make it make sense because most people don't want to do that, right? Most people don't want to go into a cage which is locked and fight another man to the death effectively. It's not something that comes natural to a lot of people. So you need to have a real extrinsic motivation for it to make sense. And unfortunately for Connor, he's like, you know, he just made so much money early on in his career. It probably is difficult difficult to kind of wake up and make that make sense and to kind of go in there with a the drive and the dog needed in order to beat someone like a Dustin Poirier who is a very very well-rounded MMA fighter and again that goes away from the skill I think just motivation that's of a, so it's obviously a concern and again when you go into the skill aspect of it you look at the top 10 in his weight class at the moment I, I think I was the other day about it and I was saying maybe of the top 10 people now in the UFC in Connor's weight class maybe the worst in there and worse than air quotes is Benil Dariush and I think Benil Dariush beats Conor McGregor right so the worst person in the top 10 Conor probably couldn't beat so the idea of him becoming champion or competing at the highest level of his weight class just isn't likely you know could he even give imagine Conor versus Dustin Justin Gaethje for instance right I mean that'll be a complete bloodbath so I don't necessarily think it kind of favors Conor anymore unfortunately I don't say the sports moved on but I just think his skill set his inability to defend takedowns it just doesn't necessarily necessarily bode well in that kind of weight class everyone there is fairly well rounded and they can do the dirty and ugly quote-unquote stuff or the stuff that Connor thinks doesn't really count as a win it doesn't necessarily favor him too much um so that basically sees it and um, but unfortunately um because he's such a big cash cow I think allegedly the numbers are he got like 20 million for the fight alone and then I've read something that it was the third highest gate of all time in UFC history if that's the case then unfortunately we're gonna see a full fight and again because of all the afters and you know Dustin Poirier's wife flipping um, um, Conor McGregor off in a ring which was really great to see actually that was quite funny and they're back and forth and stuff and the murdering and all this sort of stuff like for sure we're gonna see a full fight just because it's gonna generate clicks and people are gonna buy the pay-per-views but in terms of a sporting event and the competition there is no need to see a full fight you know there is no need Dustin Poirier is clearly the better fighter we're not gonna get any questions answered even if Con does win what what, what then are we then gonna go to a fourth fifth fight to kind of decide the actual series itself kind of you know resolutely it just doesn't make any sense going forward I think I think you should just leave it as that but I'm sure they're gonna continue um pushing forward but yeah Dustin Poirier performed pretty well I think he basically demonstrated towards the end of the first round that he probably was the better all-round MMA fighter and if the fight did continue it probably was all going to go one way but I don't think it was a foregone conclusion I still think there was a possibility that if it would have carried on and Conor didn't break his leg there was every possibility that he could have caught Dustin on the inside um you know rushing in um exchanges because I think with hands wise boxing wise even though Dustin probably I really like the way he kind of bobs and weaves and steps back and stuff and has really good feints I still think the ability for Connor to slip and line that left hand was always going to be there in the back of his head so that was definitely a possibility but in terms of demonstrating who's a better MMA fighter or UFC fighter in general Dustin Poirier proved that resoundingly really so there is no need for them to kind of go back and forth we got here an article from MMA Mania Conor McGregor's coach breaks down the loss and future plans uh, da, da, da. he said here um he said, oh, it didn't work out that way. Let's see what he says about the Conor McGregor's coach. He said, yeah, the coach says the following. He's in hospital right now. Um, this is Coach Kavanaugh. I'll be heading over there after check checking to check in on him. Um, you know, it's a bitter pill to swallow. This sport has the highest highs and lowest lows. We got to take some time to assess the next move. Is obviously now rehab and recovery is where it's at. Kavanaugh broke down the fight exchange by exchange. He said this. I studied Poirier a lot on defense. He fights with Holloway, for example, and I knew Dustin's head would be there for the guillotine. So we had drilled that a lot. Conor has a very strong guillotine a slight tactical error to go into the back going to the back with it we should get in the finish on the feet or at least get making the takedown attempt go away then we'd get back to the center of the octagon and back into boxing yeah i think someone said that actually in the commentary i think it was dc um i think there is this thinking i guess in mma if you go for the guillotine against the cage but you don't land it it kind of opens you up to getting um pinned up against the side of the cage and if somebody has superior grappling basically mauling you which ended up happening you know dustin was landing a couple of elbows and a couple of big bombs there on the side of the cage because you've got nowhere to run i guess the the obvious thing to do would be to kind of try to guillotine in the center of the ring or the center of the octagon so then you have more space to kind of your hands in and kind of get it right up against somebody's throat 
but you know um grappling isn't probably connor's forte in that respect it continues here he says as somebody who likes guillotines myself the temptation to try and throw that leg over the back and just get the finish is very very strong and Connor was the same one in there. He must have thought the grip was right and he went for it. That's what fighting's about. He went for it. Dustin did an incredible job getting his leg over to the right side of the head to relieve the pressure. Definitely true. Um, you can, yeah, and he's just a wizard at that, isn't it? So it was unlikely he was going to land. It would have been cr crazy, though, if that actually happened, right? If Conor McGregor was able to land a flipping guillotine and end it via that way, especially after saying that those kind of victories don't actually count. That would have been funny. He continues, it says, as for Poirier's ground and pound, which was severe looking enough for the two judges to hand him a 10-8 round, nothing to worry about, said the coach. Kind of, said, there was a bit of a struggle to get the head free and then he landed some decent ground and pound. Most of them on the forearm and the gloves. Connor had no marks, no bruises, no swelling or cuts, anything like that. So most of it was parried. But for sure, that was Dustin's moment. He obviously, he was obviously winning there in the judges' eyes when Dustin stood up, Connor got off some spikes. Connor got off some up kicks. Some of them whizzed by and others landed. So all and all, up until that point, let's say four and a half minutes, I wasn't concerned at all. I was actually really happy. And I knew that I was going to say, and I knew I was going to see in between rounds. I was just going to tell him to go, to keep going and doing what he was doing with the kicks to try and close a bit heavier um, this time. So we'd be looking uh, at, sorry, so we'd be looking to rather exchange punches to side back and left hand, like he did to Aldo, look for those kicks, kind of techniques, slide back, left cross, slide back left uppercut and kind of let Dustin fall into that kind of open space at the four and a half minute mark everything's gravy everything looked good technique looked good a few adjustments uh, and then I thought we were going to track to keep on finishing there and to keep it going keep the rip I don't know, man. I think obviously there's a market for Conor McGregor's fights because he's big draw. He's obviously the only real superstar there. I think if you saw the the electricity and the hype that was in that arena when he came into the ring, you know, he commands the attention. He commands the headlines. He's all over all the press. You just look at this, the stuff I have here on my um, list of news sites that are covering the UFC 264, right? BBC, The Independent, Evening Standard, Sky Sports, MMA Sports, The Sun, um, loads of different sites, BT, Paddy Power, Yahoo Sports. Like he commands the headlines, so he's a big draw. But in terms of a uh, competition and him being competing for the belt, I just don't see it personally. But we continue here. Says Conor McGregor basically silence. He's talking to you people like me. I think this is going to caption right. It's funny as well. This this is a clip from of Joe Rogan sitting down with Conor on the side of the ring, talking to him with his leg broken. There was a moment where C Joe was uh, being super sanctimonious and talking about how he's never going to interview people that are knocked out. And he did interview people that have knocked out since then. And then now he's interviewing a guy with a broken leg. <laughs> and it's like, oh, but anyway, what can we do? Uh, there's a picture here of Connor being left, um, taken out on a stretcher from UFC 264 with his leg obviously in a cast. And his caption says, for you people like me, obviously kind of leaning. It feels like he's really leaning into the hill persona more so. I think that whole kind of gracious, um, magnanimous Connor McGregor didn't work for him. It obviously didn't gene up as needed. Like I said, I just think he's just too rich. So he has to kind of give himself, um, he has to give himself a reason to get angry and to want to fuck people up. And, you know, what better way than to create this kind of fake persona there when he's just a G against the world when it worked when he was, you know, um, an up and up and kind of, you know, um, 
going against the system, you know, doing things as he wanted, coming late to press conferences and stuff because he thought he was a big draw, wearing fur mink coats and all that stuff. But now that he's legitimately driving Rolls Royces topless with his kids in the car, like it's just not the same, in it. It's just too wealthy to it to make sense, unfortunately. Um, which probably really is, which probably maybe explains. Oh, it's a quote from Scarface. Okay, any people like me, which probably explains why um we probably should give somebody like a Floyd Mayweather a lot of his flowers earlier on in it because Floyd Mayweather is kind of, you know, again, undefeated, made more money than God in the fight of, in the sport of boxing and still seems to have that hunger and that drive to prove himself athletically um, in competition, of course, you know, recently with the Logan Paul stuff, but just in general, he's always up for a scrap. He always seems to be in great shape. Um, that definitely goes to show that it's definitely not something that should be taken for granted because... Conor McGregor has shown now that sometimes with great wealth comes. Um, we are going to Justin Poirier. Um, hopefully, he gets a chance to fight for the title and get that strap around his waist. He really deserves it. Um, a really well-rounded, all-round good guy and great fighter. I think he um, speaks to something that you know good always prepares and good sleep well, and he hopes that Dustin gets the belt. So it's great to see he's kind of always got like a short list for amongst other fighters as well. So hopefully he gets a chance to get that belt around his waist before they sub into the next group of four fight in between them. But he should do anyway because I think Conor should be out for like a year. So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. Next on the list, of course, we have to talk about the Euro 2020 final that happened yesterday. Unfortunately, it's not coming home in England. Lost on penalties, three two to Italy after the fourth the game in ninety minutes finished one one. Um, bitterly, bitterly disappointing. Of course, being an England fan myself, um, but also not that surprising. I think throughout the entire time of the Euros, I've said even prior to that, also, um, I've always kind of seen Southgate very similar to how Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is and he's obviously time managing Manchester United where for the most part it feels as if the fans outside or people outside of the club seem to have a very different idea of or seem to have a different perception of what's actually going on as to the as opposed to the fans and even some of the fans are very much split in terms of how they regard the coach um there's a lot of Oli sexuals as they call them a lot of people that are very much um, Oli out in, just in general but the one thing that concerned me well, the, the one thing that concerned me in general about um, Gareth Southgate is the fact that he is way too conservative, especially given the talent in the England squad. I think it goes without saying that the England squad in general is very much um, blessed in the attacking areas, not so much in the midfield, maybe, you know, somewhat st decent in defence and the goalkeeping situations a bit of a muchness i don't think there's much separating you know uh pickford henderson and who i forgot the other guy is pope right they're all kind of on the same sort of level but in the attack is where really england sort of separate themselves from some of the other countries out there and you would imagine with the attacking talent that we have that if you're an england manager you would just make sure you have a somewhat competent and solid midfield and defense and you just flood the attack with as many attacking talents as you can and basically create or put together systems of play that bring out the best in them or if, you, if need be just tell the front five or six to basically freestyle it and hope to kind of outscore teams um when needed but obviously Southgate doesn't do that and he kind of favors a double pivot two defensive midfielders and Calvin Phillips and Declan Rice playing in front of um it looks like five defenders themselves or sometimes three depending on how you view the wing backs for the most part five so it's a very defense heavy system it kind of feels like he's sort of copying what Deschamps and what um what's his name Santos is that the guy Santos from Portugal the Portugal um national team manager where essentially they just hoped that their special players would win the game but then they kind of prioritized defense first it kind of works so far so good for England going through but again England had the easier run up up until the final they faced some of the more weaker nations all the way through they weren't necessarily tested and the times they were tested they kind of but managed to go through and Italy of course had to beat the best of the best to get to the final so all common sense told you more likely than not Italy would win in 90 minutes so Fast and aggressive, bringing the best and taking the making the best out of what we 
have in terms of our tools and attacking players. But then it felt like as soon as that goal went in, England kind of took their foot off the pedal, it felt like, in the first half. Maybe uh, maybe from the half an hour onwards. And they kind of rested on their laurels and hoped to maybe hang on until half time. But then once half time happened, we kind of crossed over the 60 minutes barrier. It felt as if the players in general just decided, okay, cool, we're going to just try and hang on to this 1 0 as much as possible and try and cut them on the break. And I just don't think you could do that. I think. in the subsequent minutes and then obviously the other team usually gets with gains control within the 10 15 minute mark but usually if you score really quickly in the first half you then have a 20 minute period where you can kind of sustain some pressure uh put the defense obviously unnerve them because if you remember in the first half a lot of the italian players were kind of struggling to kind of find each other there was a lot of kind of in there was a lot of kind of um infighting that was happening on the pitch we could have kind of an experienced team a team with actually a lot more attacking players and they would take advantage of that and kind of exasperate the situation a bit more and squeeze the vice, but we didn't. So I think in general, if we're looking at the balance of the game, Italy probably deserved to win. I think maybe, obviously England definitely deserved their lead. I think they played very well in their opening, maybe five to ten minutes. But then as soon as I felt like the game changed for me, again, this is kind of a slight to say... Oh, again, look at the possession stats. 66 possess possession for Italy to our 34. Mamma mia. And they've got double the passes. Again, maybe a lot of the passes were uh, around the back, but it felt like for me, as soon as Italy took off Immobile, who was really, again, immobile and very ineffective in the game overall, and they sort of um, switched Insignia to play in the middle... And they kind of had a lot more fluidity and interchanging of passes around this midfield and front three. The game completely changed. It felt like obviously a kind of scruffy goal. Pickford did well in terms of saving it, but he ends up kind of following in like a striker on the move. They end up getting a one-one, and then they felt like it was only going to go one way. It's the only team really pushing to try and win the game in the ninety minutes, and then for some reason. The subs come really late again for Southgate. Um, Grealish, I think, comes on first. Then it was Jaden Snow. I think, no, actually, Jordan Henderson came on first, if I'm not mistaken, right? Which is insane, which kind of shows you everything that's kind of wrong with the current approach, I think, going forward. And it's, it's hard to say, right? Because England obviously got to the final. It's hard to kind of criticise um, Southgate too much. But unfortunately, this is the nature of elite sports in general. No one really cares or remembers the good that you've done if you don't end up taking the trophy home. So in general, I think, um, especially in this game itself, just taking it specifically on this game, so Southgate should have responded a lot more or definitely tried to change things when things really weren't going his way. Maybe Saka should have come on a lot more sooner. Maybe you shouldn't bring on Henderson as your first substitution. But there should have been something to maybe change the flow of the game because it felt as if like a lot of players especially in the second half were hiding I'd say or not hiding but they're necessarily effective the Declan Rice is a good example Mason Mount uh, playing as a number 10 or on the left wing on the right side wasn't really working too well Harry Kane was somewhat isolated even though when he got the ball he was holding up pretty well he was fairly quiet Sterling of course again was the only one really kind of buzzing around and trying to find attacks but still again he wasn't really effective I thought the fullbacks were very defensive minded um, they weren't necessarily pushing forward as much. I think after the first, maybe again, after there was a couple of, there was a, maybe a cross in the second half. But I don't remember Shaw getting up too often. I don't remember Kieran and Kyle Walker. Sorry, Kyle Walker? Yeah, Kieran Trippier even, even getting forward too often. The fullbacks were very defensive minded overall. Um, again, maybe it's because Italy changed formation and tactics and ended up kind of being a lot more expansive. But I felt as if there should have been a change in personnel or tactic for something to Then the game already has kind of the momentum still shifted, and it's it England. I just feel like this team just can't do that, and I don't think international football you can 
how you would you can't kind of shit house your way to a cup you can't you know what i mean you have to kind of um present some threat to the team that you're facing i think the only time we've seen it so far has been greece in the euros right where they've kind of been able to kind of just sharp shop and just play a really ne a really kind of defensive mind negative defensive-minded way of football and that's maybe paid dividends for them but in general you can't really do that you have like you kind of have to go on the front foot a little bit so that was kind of disappointing to see and then of course the penalties people are then saying the penalties are lottery i don't necessarily believe that i think um, penalties aren't a lottery i think you practice penalties you, you know you let your best penalty takers take them there's a there's certain techniques that work the best but i feel as if when Jorginho missed his penalty, it kind of felt like to me the players didn't expect him to miss. So when short, when sorry, when Pickford saved that pen, it felt as if the pressure was back on England for some reason. And then of course, off the back of Sancho and and Rashford missing, the pressure was just too much maybe for Saka, and he kind of obviously um, felt it a little bit, and he obviously missed, and then that handed the trophy to Italy. Now the negativity around the players is going to start all the racial abuse and stuff. You know the standard protocol that happens whenever England lose, but. I think in general, if we kind of look out, maybe it was a, obviously a great kind of campaign overall. I think the what we've basically been able to prove is that this England team can compete at this level. Um, I think the World Cup is going to be far difficult, far more difficult. I think the level of competition is a lot higher in the World Cup than it is in the Euros. I think we've definitely seen that um, going forward. Some of the smaller nations in kind of world football, even South American nations like the Perus and Chiles will give uh, England a lot of issues with they, if they end up facing even the Mexicos or the like and the USA. So there is a lot of teams there that could upset and kind of... Um, kind of stop England's progression in the World Cup but since the World Cup is only what is it like a year later so next year or something right it kind of gives this team time to bounce back um, and obviously get some more experience under their belt and hopefully be able to come good again but again I just think kind of conservative nature of Gareth Southgate is always going to and kind of distribution of the ball going forward obviously um if, uh, key, and, and Rico, if key, sort of ambidextrous in that way he can go left or right um, has a real good shot on either foot as well can cross the ball fairly effectively just a very 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 good winger man very good player overall insignia may be the most frustrating player in italy um, he doesn't seem to have a middle ground he's either he's world class or he's very average he doesn't seem to play in the middle at all whatsoever um, so that's very frustrating to see immobile was pretty terrible i think if anything italy are probably lacking a very um Kind of, they don't really have any star quality men. Uh, you know, they're kind of well-rounded overall, but they don't really have a great standout striker. I think between Immobile and Belotti, which is a muchness, is not very great in terms of quality overall. So they're probably still crying out for a proper, you know, um, number nine that they can kind of use and kind of pin up up front and sort of use as a kind of you know quasi Luca Tony battering ram or somebody to run off run on for the ball or just finish goals in general but they're kind of lacking in that but overall a very well balanced team they were able to kind of 
bank from the injury crisis with um, Spinner Zoli. Emerson kind of deputized really well. Di Lorenzo played well as well. Like just generally an overall kind of well-rounded team and definitely the team that kind of deserved the overall in the Euros. So congratulations. It's not coming home. It's going. disruptive or is this what it is or people kind of you know making living via stand-up but that seems to kind of parlay the big decision to leave la of the year to some people he was speaking about since 2019 i just remember watching a clip of him on the mom couch and he was already talking about leaving la and moving somewhere else and it kind of did feel like the church was kind of approaching the end point i think a lot of people were kind of concerned about israel's health stuck in a rut and i think maybe covid was the best thing to happen to them maybe as a partnership and just in general for their expressive careers um joey then decided to move out from la and head back to new jersey he went to raise his kid in a somewhat normal environment and from what we've seen so far it's worked from his kind of review and just looking at them both now on the screen um joey diaz looks like he's lost a bunch of weight leah sayas obviously lost a bunch of weight which is incredible and great to see because a lot of people were concerned of his health and he's looked incredible and they just both look great um so it's great to see them back and looking sprightly again this podcast is episode number 78 of uncle joe's joint that he does um which is a fairly decent podcast itself kind of a solo one he gets some guests as well in Vakuda, but for the most part it's just kind of a lot of wage sage um wise advice from joey diaz and just it's just kind of a cursory shout out to them both it's great to see them both in good spirits i think this catch-up podcast which is cut up in two parts is really decent it kind of talks about their relationship and how it was somewhat mended and maybe kind of helped with their kind of stopping of the church of what's happening lisa that seemed to be in a good place he's working out he's got his own show he's doing um you know whatever i think he's got a girlfriend at the moment as well which is great joey diaz obviously doing great himself he's got the many saints of newark movie coming out it's a prequel i think the sopranos um he's just in a good space he's not doing stand-up at the moment i think he's got some very good perspective on people currently still chasing the dragon which i think is good but it's just i think it's somewhat encouraging to see decided to kind of walk out tall with their head held up high instead of kind of being dragged out on a stretcher when it comes to hollywood industry it feels as if like you look at stuff like the sopranos with ellen degeneres and all that stuff that's happening in terms of complaints in terms of the work um the working environment and how and it just felt as if like some people you know look at and you know, it's a good example right? as i mentioned she's got what two decades or something more of a kind of experience and wealth accumulation in terms of working in hollywood like when is enough is enough when will come when will the time come where she just decided to just hang up um hang it all up and just decide to retire and enjoy her money i think she decided obviously recently but it took a while it took that scandal to kind of finally for her to maybe think you know what Maybe it's time I just step away and let somebody else kind of fill my shoes for now. But it seems like people in Hollywood, once they get a taste of that fame, um, of those bright lights, they just don't want to let it go. So it's great to see somebody in Joe's position decide, hey, I'm going to voluntarily step away and kind of go and be a family man and raise my child and be a good husband and whatnot and a good friend. And so far, so good. And if he decides to come back and could do on his own, you know, to come back on his own accord, then so be it. But it's just encouraging, again, to say, to see somebody kind of walk away um, of their own volition and with their held up, head held up high, head held up high. And obviously with a lot of great memories from the church of what's happening now. And of course, creating some new ones with Uncle George Joyce. So definitely check it out. It's episode number six.
between Lisa Yeah and Uncle Joey are definitely one of my favourite shows that I definitely checked out over the weekend and it brought back a lot of good memories man to see those guys kind of in good spirits talking about all the good times and stuff like it was really really good to see definitely good to see in that regard let's move on what else do we have here we have news courtesy of the hype beast it looks like um ace of rookies vans that were spoken about a few weeks ago i think he was sitting down with the interview with gq and spoke about how he has a collaboration up and coming some sort of van slip on and now we've got confirmation here courtesy of some pictures of him i guess walking around town with the said van slip on they've sort of got that flame iconography on the side that he kind of seems to favor a lot i remember there was a time when he was wearing a lot of old schools with the flame on the side so he seems to like that kind of model um interesting that he decided to go for slip on again it's not something that you've seen him wear a lot mostly seen him wear old schools and stuff but i guess maybe he's because i'm not really i wonder with these collaborations i wonder if this is a, it's a model that they kind of want to re into want to introduce to the market and then they use celebrities in order to kind of bring them in because obviously you know it's great to kind of piggyback off someone's fame and notoriety that way or if it's rocky deciding to sit down with the vans team and decide hey i want to do a van slip on um, I quite like them. I think it's a great way to wear, you know, I'm not really a fan of slides. I think they're a bit, I don't know, they're like the male version of a bonnet. It's just something very kind of uncouth about wearing slides outdoors. But if there is a good middle ground, it's probably to have like a sort of like a regular trainer that just has doesn't have a back that you can kind of slip your foot in and out very easily. Um, that kind of works the same way as a regular slide. So that definitely looks pretty decent there i think it's a collaboration with pax on they're saying right so let's just check this here first look it says hypey says shortly after being announced we now have the first look of asa rookie's um van slip on collaboration part of the upcoming project with vans the island rapper was recently spotted wearing a pair of unreleased footwear the slip on collaboration pictured a mule style des design with a clean white base these ones include the toe caps oh it's a toe cap really there's a toe cap i don't see a toe cap there oh yeah there's sort of like a weird sort of toe cap -y thing there okay nice uh, could a toe cap um, and a flame decorations on the side you've got a picture here of rocky in new york wearing a pair with some recovering glasses great to see cut off jean shorts i guess are a thing now going forward and yeah and you've got the van slip on there they look pretty decent in it they look pretty decent i'm not going to lie so we're probably going to see those very soon and then there's some extra press pictures here courtesy of instagram of him wearing a pair supposedly it's a pack sun collaboration because he's like a creative director sort of like you know um creative director and residence celebrity sort of thing they've got a black pair here again you see the sort of um toe boxy mule thing at the front here so i'm sure they'll do fairly well when they end up eventually coming out fairly soon so keep your eye out or keep your eye open for those when they do eventually touch down then we have another look here again on the Nike Off-White Dunk Low, the 50s collaboration that, you know, haven't been much maligned around the press. People have been very upset about these in general because I guess they look fairly basic. And after all the hoopla around Virgil saying that the colorways are not going to be the same as everyone's doing in the mock-ups, they kind of turned out the same. But effectively, this is what the third or fifth or sixth, I don't know how many collaborations he's got with Nike going forward. It seems like he enjoys doing them. I think his interview recently, he said something like, um, um, he actually likes having more he he prefers to have 50 than to do one because of his kind of understanding of like hey i'm trying to provide a shoe for everybody i want you to kind of go into a store and see all my designs having to choose and having to choose between 50 i don't mind having just one kind of standalone thing and maybe in terms of a design challenge and testing himself it probably is harder to, it probably is harder to do 50 colors to do one um but yeah this white obviously with the silver is definitely the standout as is the black with the silver um you got this kind of really great off-white um kind of um pre-dyed distress midsole thing you got this really weird badge here with the one of 50 the signature silver swoosh that he likes and that kind of crinkled style leather with a little orange pull tab and of course the bungee cables um attached there on the top and then you've got some extra pictures of the box itself very diy with the duct tape around it i'm not sure if that's printed or if they're all done i guess maybe i would assume the duct tape and stuff on the boxes and all this sort of patches and the holes are definitely going to be reserved for the friends and family pair and then the gr pairs are going to be a lot more of a standard orange box that you would know from nike i guess you still get the little hang tag but the little kind of um what they called that little cable thing that people leave on their shoe you still end up getting but i think the box is definitely going to be a friends and family thing i'd assume 
going forward, but who knows? But yeah, they look fairly decent. Okay, it's got women's size in there as well. Interesting. Okay. Is that how the new boxes are? They have the women's and, and men's size in there. Because that's women's 12, isn't it? And that's US to a 10.5. And you got the men's size. I don't know. Okay, let's, let's continue. It doesn't matter. But yeah, hopefully we get word of when they're meant to come out. I think there's meant to be some convoluted way they're meant to release. Um, which is going to be definitely a bit of a headache. And there's going to be a lot of people crying. Oh, look, they got the little thing there where you're meant to make a sign of which one you got out of the 50. Let's see what happens when they end up dropping. Let's read a little bit of text here because you have hype beats. It says, adding to the anticipation, we now have another look at the off-white and Nike Dunk Low to 50. More specifically, the one of 50, which will lead the expansive range of sneakers out and continue version of its collaborative relationship with Nike. Revealing the base of the 50 sneakers, releasing of the one of 50, features a white base with a varying laces, a zip tie tag, numbered midsole badge, and industrial text. Aside from the hits, so the teal, red on the shoe, silver leather midfoot sushi serve to decorate the shoe. The exposed foam detailing is also accented by a yellowed sole, unit that contrasts with the pure white upper. Additionally, the shoe will come complete with a special shoe box mark with circle cutouts that reveal the orange wrapping paper within the box is also decorated with the off-white logo in green and haphazardly drawn Nike swoosh duct tape and edges and the 50 notation reportedly the price is going to be $180 the prices of Nike shoes are nuts in it for dunks the dunk lows are $180 god damn the off-white Nike dunk low 50 is expected to release sometime this fall um, yeah so let's see Let's see what I go on. Most people will end up getting L's as per usual because that's just, just a random state of affairs at the moment. You know, they they put out these shoes, they they leak these pictures ahead of time, many, many months. You end up kind of wanking yourself over these shoes and when you end up dropping, you don't get a pair. You end up having to cry. And then if you try to buy a shoe, a fake one, fake version from China, the same sneaker people will then end up trying to shame you. Like, you know, this game is rigged, mate. This game is absolutely rigged. And then uh, to continue with the off-white stuff, we've got here, courtesy of Hypebeast again, a look at the off-white Jordan Low, or the off-white Jordan 2 Low, which is... Pff, Jordan 2s are maybe the worst of all Jordans, I think, of the entire lineup. But maybe, no, let's say between 1 and 5 of the Tinker Hatfield designs, for sure the 2 is definitely the, the weakest, I feel like. Um, I remember the... the the kind of the first maybe collaborative two that was maybe high profile was maybe the Vashti Jordan 2 I think that she was maybe the first I'm, I'm, I'm not mistaken female to do a collaboration with Jordan 2 um, it's like a violety purple suede mo mauve whatever um, suede or nubuck one of them I forgot which one it was um, Jordan 2 and it was you know fairly okay it was a Jordan 2 mid it wasn't a low 2 um, but the model was horrible and it was kind of a bit out of order too to think that you know the first woman designer in a Jordan and she ends up getting given a Jordan 2 you know they could have given her a 1 or a 4 or something a little bit more cute but you know it is what it is and then against uh, you know many more many years later Lily May ends up getting the Jordan 1 that she does herself but hey we continue but I think with these Jordan 2s that Off-White are going to do or Virgil is going to do I, I think what I was thinking before when I saw them Obviously, you've got this weird pre-distressed midsole thing going on. You've got a signature at the top, which I'm assuming is a Tinker Hatfield signature or Jordan. I'm not sure which one is on top there. The colorway itself is fairly decent. The white and uh, white and ready sort of colorway is fairly nice. You've got this weird, again, midsole thing where it's sort of exposed. You can see the cracks are sort of like kind of taking inspiration from the polyurethane midsoles when they end up... Is it polyurethane? Yeah, PU midsoles that end up cracking over time when you actually get proper vintage shoes, which is bizarre to have a shoe that kind of looks like it's cracking but it actually isn't but all i was thinking about the jordan 2 is, is that can we crown virgil maybe the best sneaker designer of all time or collaborator especially with nike if he somehow manages to make people queue up for jordan 2s if these sell out and if these become like a thing and they end up fetching a high retail price he might have to go down as maybe one of the greatest modern day sneaker collaborators in the world like he might have to it might be hyperbole to say this, but if you can get people to care about Jordan twos, like he might be the he might be the the world's greatest. Like he might uh, you know over uh, he might leap over people like you know um, undefeated uh, Pata, um, Hiroshi Fujiwara, um, what else? Clot. You know, I mean, people that have designed some classic shoes like Futura. Like he might have to jump over all those dudes if he's able to get people to care about Jordan 2s because the model itself is garbaggio, but I like the colorway. 
um especially this one the black with the kind of royal there's also a kind of whitey one as well that's been featured that i don't think it's on here but there's a sort of white with red sort of colorway that looks banging as well but if you can make people care about these he deserves an award he deserves a trophy of some sort but it's, let's see it's with the text here the following says said to be accompanied by a red or white, white and red colorway we now have an on foot look at the off-white and nike jordan 2 low black and blue um but I've learned this take is a classic Jordan brand model. The upper of the shoe features a black and white leather as set in by a blue and Mark Jordan's. Oh, it's Mark Jordan's signature, actually. It's not Tinker Hatfield. Okay, cool. Um, the additional detailing comes in the form of exposed collar and tongues, Helvetica medial side text, zip ties, shoelaces, marked lacing, printed insoles. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, oh, yeah, printed in soles and sole units that replicate a look of crumbling soles and um, associated with vintage sneakers. There's a lot of tie in as well with the crumpled soles because I remember, you know, when Don C and all those guys were wearing retro Jordans, the big deal about them was, you know, have wearing Jordan 1 retros and 4s and the sole crumbling and having to buy another pair on the road. So there's definitely a lot of story tie in with that in general. Um, as maybe as a concept it fairly looks interesting but i'm just never been a fan of pre-distressed and make it look vintagey stuff i just think it looks a bit naff i'm much more a fan of actually encouraging people to actually wear their shoes similar to what tom shax did with the mars yards i think there was a lot of great marketing and campaigning around them as if like using them day to day and of course with the wear testing stuff that they're doing at the moment there's a way to kind of get kids to just wear the shoes and not put them in sort of you know pers um, you know clear plastic boxes and you know walk with them a certain way and not try and bend the toe box no encourage people to actually wear their shoes get some character in them get some wear and tear some love into them that's what's actually gonna make them look great but you know whatever um as a concept maybe it's cool to see how they've been able to kind of I don't know how they've actually done it to actually make it look that way it's kind of got this weird crumbling effect it's, it, maybe what they've actually done is that it's just exposed the pu but they've kind of made the sole translucent and added these little black bits to make it look like it's crumbling which is kind of a clever thing to do um but yeah no what's it you've got, a, you've got a date in mind here i don't know i guess there's going to be a, a big time to these in terms of clothing and stuff the date is now september 23rd so not not that long to go i'm assuming there's going to be some clothing acti big activation launched in because it just doesn't make any sense why he's doing a jordan 2 um not really not in my head but i'm sure there's something tied into it but again like i said what do you reckon do you think jordan or virgil's the greatest collaborator or nike collaborator of all time I definitely think he's up there if he gets people to care about the Jordan 2. But let me know what you think in the comments down below. Let's move on from that one. What else we got here? Let's move on. That we don't see the MOA. We don't care about that. We don't care about this. What time is it? Have I used enough time already? Whoops. Put that back here. There we go. Okay, what else have we got? Boom, boom, let's move on. Bear with me a second. Du, du, du. Oh yeah, let's talk about S actually. I think there was a that was it in it. Was it deck mantle news in it, right? Ba 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 deck mantle. There we go. Because unfortunately that's had to get cancelled due to the ch ever changing nature of COVID over there in Netherlands, they've had to call Deck Mantle off, man. And the lineup this year was absolutely mad as well, man. So, so, so annoying. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. There we go. Oh, where is it? Come on. Why is it not loading so quickly? Deck Mantle cancelled. Bear with me. Let's see if I can get up here. Okay, there we go. We got it here. Yeah, unfortunately, there has been an update here. Let me see if I can get up on my screen regarding Degmental and the up and coming festival that's going forward. Da, 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 da. Uh, okay, cool. Update. Um, a few of us still be doing it. Okay, let's actually go there. What, what they're saying here? They've got this full announcement. 
Let's go, dig man. Let's go in there, dig man. Tool. Let's see if I can get up on here. Let's go in there. Let's go on the actual Twitter page and see if I can get it up on here. Because I think they've actually got it listed on their actual site telling people what's actually going down specifically. So let's see if I can get that loaded up on the screen. Bish bash bosh. Bish bash bosh. Okay. Oh, load, 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 load. Okay, cool. Mm -mm -mm. Bear with me a second. Okay. So. Okay, yep. Yeah, so there we go. So just to kind of end for now, it looks as if Deck Mantle Festival 2021 has been postponed again until next year, 2022. And some more distressing news for people all around the world who are really looking forward to going. I had a slight possibility that that could be a thing for me to go to. Again, maybe there's a lot more preparation regarding to making it work. But, you know, unfortunately, this time again, it had to get cancelled due to the ever-changing nature of COVID in the Netherlands. It says here, courtesy of Deck Mantle website, Deck Mantle Festival. 2021 um, a statement they released that it feels a little unreal we are pinching ourselves over being able to share this message for you but after last week's news shared by Dutch government oh, okay no this is oh what chances uh, okay this is not it this is the update from the other time let's go on the actual Twitter page itself because they actually had to make a statement the other day talking about it so this is it from the 9th ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's make sure it loads so I can read it for you. Come on, come on, come on. Yep, says here. So it, um, caption says, we are devastated to tell you that Dick Mantle 21 is postponed. Read on the news and statement. Stay safe. Much love, Team Dick Mantle. So it says the following here. And you click the actual icon itself. Hopefully it loads. My computer is being slow for some reason. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Come on, come on, come on. Load, 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 load. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, okay finally there we go this is not the quickest thing to use in this regard but hey we are here so it says the grand 21 2021 postponed we have been working around the clock to make the amount of festival a reality this year so it's with a heavy heart that we have to hereby inform you that we are forced to postpone the 2021 edition to 2022 so it's twice in a row mad in it a couple of weeks ago the dutch government officially allowed all event promoters to um organize outdoor events today due to a sharp rise in cases as a result of, of a failing public test system the same government decided to abruptly revert to the policy that has permitted all outdoor events until august 13th so they only enjoy two weeks of freedom and i think that's why i featured previously on, on my podcast about dick, dick dixon recently playing in amsterdam it's probably one of his best performance of late um, definitely goes to show that even though there's an abundance of playgrounds throughout the entirety of lockdown there really isn't nothing like a proper party with actual normal people and not just rich fucks going you know to fucking third old countries and partying up the place and making it look completely crap that's actually one of the better ones and it kind of boded well for Dick Mantle going forward but allegedly from what I've heard on the ground floor from people that actually live there or from that place there was a lot of very dubious and kind of um, questionable things happening with testing and people faking tests and just generally there's a lot of kind of resistance against the vaccine and the industry itself it felt like maybe the nightlife and night or maybe the nightlife and clubbing scene in general were probably pushing to have events and pushing them to or pushing events and doing unlicensed and obviously quote unquote illegal events in spite of maybe some of the stipulations put forward which then inevitably led to the uprising in cases so some people on the ground have been saying this has been coming um it's just kind of people were maybe kind of burying their head in the sand um but it's just unfortunate for people again that are not there that haven't really much got their ear to the ground just to you know put all that plan together book your airbnb get your flights in order thinking you're gonna go and then suddenly if it's to be postponed again just goes to show what i've said prior is like you shouldn't necessarily try and plan too far ahead when it comes to events this year or in subsequent years really until we finally got a handle in the situation especially in europe where things get you know somewhat to back to some sort of normality overall 
I think you should just kind of try and enjoy the moment, um, see what's available to do in the immediacy, do them as you can, enjoy them as much as you can, um, because there's no guarantee that you book something two months, three months, four months ahead of time that you're going to have any possibility of maybe enjoying to doing that thing. So, and again, there's nothing worse than holding out for something that you really want to go to and then having it be postponed many, many months in advance. It's just not necessary. So try and make the best situation you have available now instead of planning too far ahead that would be my advice it continues the statement here it says when a couple of weeks ago the green light was given we were on the verge of cancelling our festivals due to the short preparation time however with the government's blessing we started working around the clock with dedicated um but determined de de but decimated crew to make this festival a reality oh yeah yeah imagine that man and um, the last few weeks we've adapted to these extraordinary circumstances as best as possible it's very painful to watch the reality that we are unable to deliver an amazing festival and that all our work has been for nothing for the second year in a row we have a lot of unanswered questions at the moment and we understand that you might have them as well. We promise that all ticket holders will be offered a fitting solution and we will get in touch next week with ticket options via email. Please wait with reaching out to our support team for now. The impact of this decision has on our small crew and our artists who play at our festival, our partners and our team of freelancers is enormous. Last year, many of you showed your support, which meant a great deal to us and helped us get through the year, for which we're extremely grateful. And we trust that we'll dance together in Amsterdam, boss, into a 22 stay safe much love team deck mantle it must be brutal in it like you finally feel like you're you're out of the weeds you finally feel like you're crossing the line and then boom you get hit with another sledgehammer absolutely shocking state of affairs but again safety first and safety is paramount but there is a feeling especially with things going on at the moment especially what's happening with israel you know they've had one of the better sort of adoption rates or kind of you know was it adoption whatever it's called where people want to take the vaccine and still the variants have kind of raging their ugly head again so it doesn't seem like there's any real better way to do things it feels like again if you have a whole nation that's compliant it obviously helps but we don't live in a utopia or an ideal world so that's never going to happen we're always going to have uh, some covid deniers some people just you know willfully unaware some people just don't want to get it done so we have to kind of just handle the situation as best as possible but then of course on the flip side one of the main spreaders of these sort of respiratory diseases unfortunately is going to be people locked in close proximity indoors or outdoors um is definitely going to be a case for a super spreader type event so what do you do do you just accept the deaths and the cases that are going to rise off the back of that in the hope of restarting the economy and getting people back on their feet or do you take the more cautious approach and just kind of stop everything stop movement stop kids going outdoors make this illegal put people out of business again you know the amount of people that have been affected due to deck mantle being postponed again um is definitely going to be devastating i don't know what the resolution is at the moment what i can say is with the options available wherever you are in europe or across the world make the most of the situation make the most of the situation you have at the moment and just you know play it by ear but don't plan things too far in the head because as being proven with this deck mantle festival the rug can get pulled under your feet very very quickly um, and with probably little to very little notice going forward but you know what can you do what can you do Anyway, that is the Excellent English Show episode number 474. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. Please make sure you smash that subscribe button. Leave a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, a five-star review and a share will help the show go a long way. And support via Patreon is welcome too. You get bonus episodes on there at patreon.com. For just Agostino. So check that out in the show notes and descriptions. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace.